when the world was in chaos and darkness, God said, Let there be light, and there was light. From the darkness, destruction and despair of a past year. It is time to rise again. New life is coming to dead things and situations. New opportunities are replacing lost ones. Our morning is turning to dancing as the death of winter gives birth to the life of spring. The dry bones are living again. God has remembered us so. It is time to rise. It is time to rebuild. It is time for renewal and restoration. 2021, the year of resurgence. Please stand and welcome our senior pastor, Dr. Frank Ofosu Apia. Amen and amen and amen. Please keep standing, keep standing. Don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. Listen, standing is a statement. It's a statement that you have feet. And when you have feet, feet is a symbol of authority that you are walking here on earth. He said, any place that the soles of your feet shall tread, I've given it to you. Welcome to this service. Um, we thank God for the gift of life. Listen, any day above the ground is a good day. And this is a day that God has made for us. Listen, before you are seated, I want us to welcome all our friends and family who are worshiping with us this morning through the miracle of technology on all the platforms. Listen, put your hands together. Let's, let's, let's give them a warm, caress house. Welcome to this morning's service. It's going to be epic. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be fast. It's going to be furious. It's going to educate you. We are going to sing. We are going to laugh. We are going to dance together to the glory of Almighty God. Welcome, friends and family, everywhere all over the world, from Africa, from North America, South America, Central America, the islands of the Caribbean and the Pacific, Asia, Europe, Australia, all over the world. Welcome. And listen, before you are seated, pick up your tablet and share. Share with somebody. Tell them to come to church. It's happening this Sunday morning right here in 781 Athens Highway, Loganville, Georgia. We are going to have some mighty times before the Lord. Now, you may be seated if you can. You may be seated if you can. We thank God for today. We're going to get into the Word of God in a minute. And um, if you have your Bibles with you, please uh, pick up your Bibles um, or turn on your tablet. Listen. If you, are 30 years, uh, if you are 30 years and above, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. And if you are 30 years and below, turn on your tablets to Acts chapter 10, 17. We're going to do that. I want to give a chance to everybody. The old ones, we open our Bibles. The young ones, you turn on your tablet. It's all good. But Acts chapter 17, we're going to read Acts chapter 17, verse number 22 through 28. It's very, very powerful. Acts 22, uh, Acts 17, I beg your pardon, it's right there on your screen too. Acts 17, verse number 22. You ready? Let's go. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. In fact, the literal Greek says you are very superstitious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made, now no, this is the burden, where the burden of today's message is coming from. He says he has made from one blood, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Father, we pray in the name of your son Jesus that let there be illumination and understanding upon your word. 
You have declared that the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. I pray, O oh Father, that you give me clarity of thought. You give me accuracy of speech. Let these words that come out of my mouth not just be the words of a man. Let it not come to your people with enticing words of man's wisdom, but let it be in the demonstration of your spirit and your power. That the faith of these men and women all over the world that listen to your servant will not dwell on the philosophy of a man, but on the power of God. Bring light into our darkness. Make us better people than we came in. We thank you for answered prayer. In the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, somebody agree with me and say amen and amen. 2021, this is our year of resurgence. And you know it comes out of Genesis chapter number 8. You know the Bible says that, and the Lord remembered Noah in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of the flood. For 150 days, waters, the grounds broke, the heavens broke. All humanity, all vegetation, except eight people were saved in an ark. We've been talking about that since January. And uh, we, we saw that, how the resurgence began, then the faith, then the grace. And then we, 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 we are coming to this. And um, the Lord remembered, no, I want you to understand that when the Bible says God remembered somebody, it's not because God forgot about you. But it's because he came at the right time to meet you at the right place. And in verse number 11, which you see on this, your screen, it says that Noah sent, no, first of all, he sent a raven. The raven went all over and didn't come back. Why? Because the raven is a dirty bed and it feeds on dead flesh. All the dead, the raven fed on it. But the dove kept coming back because it's a bed of purity, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so the dove came back. And the Bible says that at one time, the dove came back with an olive leaf branch in its mouth, tell, telling us that new life has begun. We are in a pandemic, and God says that, listen, new life is about to come. And so he gave us the word resurgence, and I told you I found a very difficult word so that some of you may not be able to pronounce it properly or at least make, make, make a whole lot of things. So it's resurgence, and some of the synonyms for resurgence is renewal. God is bringing us renewal this year. After the pain of this pandemic, it will go away, but God will renew us. It also means restoration. Restoration means to return to the original. In the mind of the Greek, when they say re restoration, it means balancing of accounts. It means returning to the original intention. It also means recovery. And I like this one. I've been saying it all the time. Resurgence also means a glorious comeback. And any time I think about resurgence, I see that it is a capsule of the story of the Bible, the love story that God wrote to you and I from the Bible. You cannot read the Bible with an open heart and not agree with me that this book, the Bible, is a book of redemption. Every story, every narrative, every example, every illustration, in one way or the other, describes the heart of God towards humanity, and that is redemption. Redemption means to buy back something which has been lost. You redeem it. You redeem it with a price. That is why Jesus Christ did not redeem us with, with the blood of bulls and goats or, or gold or anything, but with his own blood, the, the, the zenith of what he can give because the life of every flesh is in the blood. And Jesus gave that sinless blood so that you and I, who are sinners by excellence, will become holy to the glory of Almighty God. Now, in these past months, so much has been lost because of this pandemic. Unless you are living under a rock that you only understand. Lives have been lost, unfortunately, painfully. Jobs have been lost. Relationships have been frayed. Businesses have gone down. And, and all kinds of things have happened. But one of the saddest things that I've realized is that people's spiritual vitality has also become affected. People who used to be on fire today, your faith has flatlined. Let me tell you something. This pandemic, I don't know about you, but for me, it's a teacher. This pandemic has become a revealer as a leader in this world. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon, you've heard me say many times, in 18, around 1860, he was a pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. And during that time, there was an epidemic, a cholera epidemic, that was killing people by their hundreds every day in the city of London. Between 600 and 1,000 people were died. They were succumbing to this disease. But every day, this great prince of preachers, this man of faith, will stand in his pulpit in the Metropolitan Tabernacle and preach the faith of Jesus Christ to a dying nation. And Charles Spurgeon said something. He said, this epidemic did not come to defeat us. Rather, it came to reveal us. And I'm sure many leaders, especially these leaders of the church, who attest to this, that this pandemic that has come into this world has come to reveal many, many people in this body of Christ. And I pray that as you listen to me today, you will not be numbered amongst the people that during this pandemic, their faith so died that they never worshipped the God who kept them. Please let me tell you something. You have questions, and I have them too. And I've told you that I have worked with God long enough to, to know that many times he doesn't answer our questions. Number one, because he's not on trial. And number two, 
Many times, the answer that he gives you may not be your solution. It is your attitude to what is happening that is your solution. So you've got to understand that. We all have questions and we ask them. But at the heart of every matter must be your anchor of faith in a God who knows what you and I don't know. It's a God who has seen what you don't see. I was telling a preacher the other day, came to visit me and I was telling the person, like, listen, you must thank God that God called you during this pandemic. Because he knows that there's a pandemic that will come in the year 2000 and whatever. And he will need champions to stand to hold the hands of the world and bring them out of the darkness. Aren't you glad that God saw beyond you and placed you strategically in a place today where you can be a leader in this painful time? Please listen to me and listen to me well. God knows what you and I don't know. He sees what you and I don't see. But the beautiful thing is that we serve a God who does his best work. He shows his best hand when we find our backs to the wall. That is why he will look at the people who had no sophisticated weapons. They had come out of, I mean, 430 years of captivity. And they, they meet a formidable barrier called Jericho, the, the, the walls of Jericho. They didn't have the wherewithal to bring the walls down. They had no weapons. And God said, listen, I want to show you my hand. March around the city and don't talk for seven days. I know those people were charismatic, though. They had to shut up for seven days and not say anything, not have a say so about anything. And for seven days, and I'm sure on the walls of Jericho, the, the city was mocking them. Is that how you go to war? Didn't Egypt teach you how to go to war? But listen, God's ways are diametrically opposed to our ways. He said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways. Listen, there's something called the wisdom of God. And that wisdom has no understanding. One of the finest brains ever to walk on this earth was Paul the Apostle. I'm telling you, Paul the Apostle, he had wisdom, he had insight. The only one that was carried into the third of, third of heavens and saw things and heard things inexpressible that he was not given permission to talk about. In the midst of the wisdom and the knowledge. He looks at how God does this and in exasperation, he says, oh, the depths of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways. And so when God tells you to do something, it may look stupid, it may sound stupid, but at the end of the day, God and you shall have the last laugh. These people went down the wall, went round the walls for seven days without talking. In the end, God said, just shout. And you're asking, shout? Is that how you prosecute a war? But God said, listen, the, the feeblest voice can have the power of God in it to bring down every war. I'm talking about a God who encounters a failed fisherman. He had fished all night and caught nothing. His business was about to go down. And yet Jesus comes to that man and looks at Simon Peter and said, hand me over the symbol of your fellow. I'm talking about your boat. And after he has done that, he said, take the same nets and take the same boat that has failed you and go to the same place that you failed and cast that same net into that same place and let me show you what I can do. And the Bible says that when Peter obeyed, God gave him a net breaking and a boat sinking miracle. I'm talking about a God who is on record as saying that weeping may endure for a night. Listen, weeping may endure for a night. In the literal Hebrew, he says that weeping may come to you like a guest in a hotel. But in the morning, it's got to check out. That's something you've got to understand. I like the conjunction. Weeping may endure for a night. But in the time you see the word but, it's an adversative conjunction. It means something that started is about to be negated. Weeping has endured from last year beyond this pandemic. We have wept a lot, but joy is coming. Resurgence is coming to you. So somebody tonight, today in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every February in America is designated as Black History Month. And today I want to talk to you about blacks in history. Maybe once a year we get the opportunity to talk about our history. Because it is the time that has been set aside in America where this viable, necessary part of this melting pot called the United States of America tell their story and others learn their history. I believe that it is time for us to appreciate the contribution of people of color, painful that it may be, to the rise of this great nation called America. People of color, blacks, broken backs, done things to help this nation. Now, when you look at the great seal of America, when you look at the great seal of America, the seal of America, there's an inscription. You, you see an eagle, the bird of destiny, the bird of America, with, with, with I think, like lightning signs are coming out, and then, then, then there's an olive branch, which means war and peace. But the seal says, E pluribus unum. On the great seal of America, E pluribus unum. This is a Latin phrase. That was proposed by three of our founding fathers during the founding of America. John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. 
They put together this idea and they put the great seal there on the seal of America called E Pluribus Unum, which means out of many, one. Out of many, one. Or in simple, low gravel English, one from many people. One from many, union, one from many people. It was, the idea was to encompass a determination of this new nation to form one great nation from a collection of states and people from everywhere. Now, you and I don't need any help. You don't need a PhD to observe that this out of many one has applied to some, but has excluded some in this America. It has excluded a whole lot of us. The happenings in our nation, especially these fa past few years, right here in America, has brought to the forefront what has been the hidden normal for years. You know, there have been a lot of protests, there have been a lot of everything, police brutality, the shootings and things. Listen, it has never been new. It's always been there. It's only that today we have technology to empower it to be seen. That is why we are seeing it. And my purpose for this lesson today is not to put one people over another or put one person under, under people. But if you should ask me one word, Pastor, what it is, it's education. I am seeking to educate all of us, whether you are black, you are white, you are brown, you are, you are striped, you are polka dot, we need to be educated. Why do I say that? Listen, there's a, a, a terrible virus going around the world today. But there's an even deadlier virus that you may not know, and that is the virus called ignorance. Ignorance. Because this thing called ignorance has spawned many sons and daughters. Wars are many times a result of ignorance. Tribal wars, racial wars, stereotypes, biases, racism, segregation, hatred, they all come because people are, because if you don't know me, you will not understand me. If you don't take your time to get to know me, you, you will prejudge me because ignorance has kept people divided. People, ignorance has kept people imprisoned in mental jailhouses. Ignorance feeds on misinformation. And when that happens, it breeds prejudice. So much prejudice in the land. And the word prejudice comes from the Latin prejudicum, which means you prejudge me. You form conclusions even before the facts are known. And too many times in our nation, in our world today, ignorance has blighted the true meaning of e pluribus unum. So the question that I want to ask all of us, how did we get here? How did we become so polarized? How did we get to that place where we have, we have allowed the color of a person's skin to be so powerful? Listen, you, did, you, you, have no, you, you have no choice in what color you came out with. But please listen to me. Why, has, how, why have we come to that place where Dr. Martin, like Dr. Martin Luther King said some years ago, that 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour in the American church today? Why must it be so? So we have our black church, our white church, our Chinese church, our this church. Our, why must it be so? The church of Jesus Christ, which the apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 15, that the church must be the pillar and the ground of truth unfortunately has used the Bible, twisted its message of freedom, and built barriers, racial barriers, gender barriers, political barriers, and unfortunately, nationalistic barriers. And the South outcome, as I travel all over the world, I've encountered people who, are, who feel that, listen, Christianity is a white man's religion. And some even go on to say that the Bible is a book of slavery. And whenever I'm confronted, I bristle like a cat who has been put in a corner. And I said, no, sir, no, madam. The Bible has never been and will never be a book of, 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 of slavery. It is never a book that puts one person down over the other. Listen, you will see it, like I'm going to get into the Bible briefly, to know that Christianity is multi-ethnic. Every shade, every color. Every heart is part of the story. And hear me, whoever you are or wherever you come from, the color of your eyes or your skin, you are part of the story of God's redemption. Now, let me make a quick synopsis here about black presence in the Bible. I think I've taught it several times. You can go to the bookstore or something and order for the series about black presence or, or the other message, what is wrong with being black. You can go in there. But let's go to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says that God took the death of the earth and made somebody just like him. Now, my question is, what color was Adam and Eve? God, in his own wisdom, chose not to let us know. That is why God made Israel his chosen people. If you ask me, why did he make the Egyptians his chosen people or the, the Ghanaians? Or the, listen, if God made Nigerians his chosen people, Ghanaians would have gone to war. 
If God made the Japanese his chosen people, Chinese wouldn't allow. They would go to war. So God says, I've chosen this little nation. God does what is interrogative. He sits on the circle of the earth and he does that which pleases him. But we all know, listen, that the first human beings, Adam and Eve, they were made out of death. That is where we all started. And of course, listen, the death that God took and made Adam and Eve, we don't know the color. And of course, I've traveled all over to know that death is color. It has color. So that is the chance. That's where we all started. And of course, we know that at a point, the whole of humanity was destroyed. We were decimated. Only Noah and his three sons and their wives were left. Noah's son were Sham, I beg your pardon, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they were, they were spared. And the Bible says that from these three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole world was repopulated. Now the Bible talks about the fact that, that Ham, Ham was the father of black people. And that is where all the crazy myth of blacks being cursed began. You will not believe the amount of material out there about the fact that, and it's from the church and from pulpits, that all black people are cursed because they came from Ham, because Ham was cursed. Now, you have to read your Bible properly without, without racial sunglasses. And read the Bible well and understand. Now, let me, let me do a little thing here. Let me do a little thing here. Now, please put on the screens for me Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 1. Genesis 9 and 1. When they came out of the ark, the Bible says that, and the Lord God blessed Noah and his sons. I want you to repeat it. The Lord blessed Noah and his sons. Say it one more time. I want you to say it like your mouth belongs to you. The Lord blessed Noah and his sons. God blessed them. God is a blesser. He blessed them. There was a blessing upon all of them. Not two of them, but all of them. God blessed Noah and God blessed all the sons. There was a blessing there. There was no curse. But something happened. The Bible says that Noah began to be a farmer. The last time I preached, I think I talked to you about that on productivity. He began to be a farmer. Then he turned into, he had a distillery. And then he was drunk and he was naked in his tent. Listen, everybody has a right to be naked in their own tent. Especially when they haven't invited you in there. What people do in their own tent is their business, not your business. Everybody has the right. But of course, you know, all kinds of things happened. Ham had saw it and went to the brothers. The other, uh, Shem and Japheth went and covered. And the Bible says, let, let's go to verse 24 of Genesis 9. Noah woke up from, from sleep. And he saw what the young man had done, what Ham had done. And the Bible says that, verse 25, look at it. And Noah cursed Canaan. Where, where, where is Canaan coming from in this thing? Ham did the thing, whatever it was. But God bypassed him, uh, I mean, Noah bypassed him and cursed his son. Now, you are going to know that Ham had three children. The firstborn was, Ham, the firstborn was Cush, and I'll come there. The second was Mizraim. If you know anything about me, Mizraim is Egypt. Then Put, then the lastborn is Canaan. Three, four, four children. But the Bible says that Noah, when he woke up from sleep and he saw what had happened, he cursed Canaan. Now, my question is, why couldn't he curse Ham? And people are preaching and writing that Ham was cursed, and so all black people are cursed. Listen, I have a question. When they came out of the ark, the Lord blessed Noah and his sons. Now, Noah drinks, and he's naked. He wakes up, and he begins to curse. I have a question. The blessing of God and the curse of a drunkard, which one is more powerful? Noah couldn't curse whom God has blessed. Let me tell somebody here, get it and get it deep. Nobody can curse you. Stop walking about with all this generational curse. Listen, you carry a generational blessing. There is a blessing upon your head. Know that the blessings of the Lord, it will make you rich and has no sorrow to it. You've got to understand that. He couldn't curse one whom God has blessed. Cush was not blessed. Was not cursed. I beg your pardon. Mizraim, put, they were not cursed. It was Canaan. That's another story for another time. Now, the firstborn of Ham was Cush. And Cush means black face, burnt face, or black man. That's all where we started. And all through the Bible, there's black presence in there. I spent a lot of time teaching about that in the past. But the first great leader ever after the flood was Nimrod. Nimrod was the son of Cush, was the son of the black man. Now, if I'm a black man, I'm not going to give birth to a, a, a blue-eyed Scandinavian person. No, he gave it to that person. And, and, and Nimrod, he built kingdoms, the kingdom of Babel. Where the tower fell, Erech, Akkad, Assyria, Nineveh, Rehoboth. This, this was a man, a black guy, a black brother. He was building cities. The Bible talks about Jethro. You know, we all know Jethro, the, the father-in-law the father of Moses. 
The Bible calls him the priest of Midian. He was a descendant of Abraham. You see, sometimes people wonder, he's a priest? Yes, he is a priest. Because when Sarah died in Genesis 25, Abraham married a sister, a black woman, Keturah, and had five or six children, Zimran, on all, and one of them was Midian. And the Bible says he gave them gifts and he sent them away far. So when these guys were leaving, they took their father's faith with them. And so please don't, don't sit back and think that you are the only one who knows God. There are people in places that you have never met who know God. That is why his judgment at the end of the day is according to his wisdom, not according to what you think you know. Because there are people who are sending everybody to hell. Who made you a judge on the, on the throne of God? The Paul says that on that day, God will judge according to the intents of people's heart and according to the gospel. So God's judgment is without hypocrisy. You've got to understand that. He carried it. And so when, when Abraham married his daughter, Abraham, I beg your pardon, when Moses married Jethro's daughter, Moses married somebody else. And listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, this is the man who schooled Moses in leadership, organization, the art of delegation, care groups. Listen, historically, there have been black pharaohs ruling in Egypt for hundreds of years. Then respected National Geographic magazine, and I have, I have it, I think I brought it to church to show you before I read from They researched it and they found out that there have been hundreds of pharaohs who were black. In fact, they tell us that the pharaoh who was there when, when Moses came out of Egyptian captivity, he was as black as me. Black. But because of reinvention of history and racism, this fact has been kept under wraps for many years. Moses, he married a sister. He married an African-American woman. His brother and sister didn't like it, and God had to give them a staff meeting and baptize Miriam with leprosy. He said, you don't like a person of color? Okay, I'm going to give you a new makeup for you to begin to respect other people's skin. You are judging by skin. I'll show you your skin, what can happen. Bathsheba, that Solomon married and gave birth to Solomon, was a black woman. Bathsheba, she was from Sheba. Sheba is black. So our great wise man, wise friend, Solomon was black. Hagar was black. Zephaniah the Cushite, you see it in your Bible, Zephaniah the I, I, I'm saying all this for you to understand. This abuse your, your mind from the fact that makes you think that everybody in the Bible is a white European. No, there are more people of color in the Bible than white Europeans. We need to go back and read the book. Ebed Melech, who got Jeremiah out of the dungeon, he was a black man. In fact, if we go into the New Testament... When our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was carrying his cross to go to Golgotha to die for you and I, the Bible says that there was a man called Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene is in North Africa. He carried Jesus' cross. In the church of Antioch, Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, put it up there on the screen. In the church of Antioch, there were some prophets, there were some teachers who had come, and they were worshiping, they were fasting, they were ministering to the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit said, separate to me, Paul and Barnabas, for the ministry that I have ordained them for. And you realize that, they were, they, their names were mentioned there. Paul was one, Barnabas was one. And the Bible says that there was somebody called Lucius. Lucius of Cyrene from Africa. Then there was Simon Ni who was called Niger, black man. So at least two of the people in there were blacks. And they laid hands on Paul and they sent him on a missionary journey. Which means God is not biased. Do you know that there are some denominations in America today that were formed because they wouldn't allow a black man to ordain other people? When the Azusa Street Revival started and William Seymour, a one-eyed black person, received the power of the Holy Spirit and started the Azusa Revival, it was racial lines that killed the move of God. It was racial lines that killed the move of God. Please hear me and please hear me well. It was an Ethiopian accountant in the court of Queen Candace of Ethiopia who took the faith of Jesus Christ, of the gospel, into Africa. Some of the great church fathers were black people. St. Augustine of Hippo was a black man. Saint Athanasius was called the black dwarf. Tertullian, the great father, Tertullian, who coined the word Trinity. You know, Trinity is not in the Bible, but it was Tertullian who brought it. He was a dark-skinned man. So please hear me. We are all part of the story of the Bible. The Bible is not a white man's book. Don't let anybody lie to you about that. Now, let me come down to where we are today. In this United States of America, People of color, black men and black women, have made great contributions. Unfortunately, over the years, their stories and their achievements have not been told. In fact, I was reading on, on, on the net a couple of days ago, and there's, a, there's a, the educational district in a, in a place in Utah. In Utah, they have, they have, they have 
sent a note to parents to opt out of Black History Month so that their white children would not learn about the history of this great nation. How ignorant can a person be? And I can bet your last one dollar that these people go to church. Please hear me and hear me well. We have to tell our story. Because if we don't tell, there's a South African proverb that says that until lions have their own historians, the story about the hunt will always be told to glorify the hunter. Until lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Now, I'm going to recommend a book. All of us are going to read this book. I made mommy read it. It's called Setting the Records Straight. It was written by David Barton. It was written by David Barton. Setting the Records Straight, American History in Black and White. Setting the Records Straight, American History in Black and White by David Barton. And he gives us, a, I mean, I, I had to pull an all-nighter to read this book. And I've reread it. It's, it's just amazing being educated about this great nation and the contribution that black people have done to this nation. And it gives, it gives it to give you a telling insight of how blacks, though we first came into these shores unwillingly, we have withstood and we still withstand horrible atrocities. And yet, out of the pain, out of the atrocities, we have contributed to the greatness of this nation. This book is recommended. When you read that book, you go beyond the usual uh, suspects that we all think are the great ones, like Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, like W.E.B. W. Du Bois, uh, Malcolm X, Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, Franco Fusuapia, you know, all those people, but <laughs> Mike Tyson and uh, Tupac and all these people. Listen, you are going to, uh, you, you will find extraordinary heroes that you have not learned about. Somebody like Reverend Hiram Rose Revelle, who became the first black senator. What he went through in order to become a senator. You read about Joseph Rainey, who overcame, he was a slave, but he overcame slavery to become the first African-American elected to the U.S. Congress. And he served as Speaker of the House. Yes, a black man. You didn't know that. You read about John Rock, the first African-American who was admitted into the U.S. Supreme Court bench. When we come to invention, I can list hundreds of them for you to know that people of color have been part of the industrialization of this nation. I know, I know, uh, well, maybe air conditioning is working, but where would you and I be during the height of the balmy Atlanta summer, where the heat becomes unbearable without air conditioning? It was invented by Fred Jones, July 12, 1949. He was a black man. The automated lightning, lightning control, Gravin Woods, in fact, blood bank, where they are able to bank the blood, A, O, all the racist things, it was done by Charles Drew. The humidity, it goes on and on. Little did I know that there were some three African-American women mathematicians, I can't leave our sisters out of it, who played a pivotal role in space exploration. It was through them, you, I'm sure you've watched the movie Hidden Figures. These three black women, they worked out this one so that John Glenn can get into orbit. Now, the purpose of this thing that I'm talking about is just to educate you, not just about the past, but more importantly, to inspire you for the future. Yes, there have been injustices. Next, uh, knees have been placed on our necks. Shackles, shorts, everything. But listen, what pains me right now is that too many of our prominent pulpits in this America are strangely quiet. I am not about to be quiet. I am standing to be seen and I am speaking to be heard. Because when God places a call upon your life, part of your assignment is to speak against injustices. So that justice will roll the mountain like a river. Listen, Dr. Martin Luther King said something, let me say to America, that at the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Let's not forget this. We will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of... It's time for the American people to thunder and speak up against the injustices against the people of color. We have sweated with knees, with, with, with knees on our necks. Legislation unjust have been done to, to stop people from exercising their legal votes. But it will not define you. It will not define me. Great South Africa. And listen, Paul quoted some, some secular poets. And I'm going to quote somebody. A great South African singer, Labi Sifri. He sang a song that something inside is so strong. 
and I know that I can make it. Listen, there's something on the inside of you that is so strong. Listen, your love, your power, your desire to break through must be stronger than all the hatred that has come against you. Listen, somebody can put you down, but it is up to you to get up one more time. Somebody can press you back, but it's up to you to rise up one more time. Let me give you three prescriptions and I'll stand out of your way. Three things I want to give to you. Number one, number one. As we learn this history, as we look at the past and we look at the present and everything that's happened, there are three things that I want to leave with you. Number one, don't be imprisoned by hate. Do not be imprisoned by hate. Because when you have been subjected to so much pain, it is very easy to reply hate with hate. Oh, I remember one time I was a student and I, I went on, uh, on a second man. You know, they, they take us to churches where we spend some time understanding the pastor. And this pastor, I'm talking about white Great Britain, took me to visit some people and went to this home, an elderly white lady. And uh, after we, I sat down quietly listening, and before we went, the pastor said, mentioned the woman's name, quite elderly, maybe in her 80s, and said, we want to pray for her. The woman said, sure. I said, I want to uh, ask Frank to pray. The woman said, no, he, he can't pray for me. I can't stand blacks. He can't pray for me. <laughs> You want to ask me what did I do? Nothing. That's why I'm still standing here. I could have committed murder, but I'm still standing here. <laughs> but I felt sorry for her. Listen, hatred, bitterness, resentment are building materials for your own incarceration. When you allow it, listen, resentment and bitterness is the only cup of poison that you drink expecting another person to die. It doesn't work. Don't allow hatred to hold you down. Yes, injustices are powerful. But they are only as powerful as you continually replay them in the theater of your mind and you seek revenge. Don't allow people's bigotry and their hatred to deny you of your, of, of your Christian ability. When they go low, go high, step up on the high road of Christian maturity. If you read the biography of Nelson Mandela, one of the great leaders in South Africa, in his autobiography, The Long Walk to Freedom, he says something, let me repeat, let me quote. He said, as I walked out of the door, toward the gate that will lead to my freedom. I knew that if I, don't, if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. Could it be that because of something that somebody did or said, called you names, you are carrying hatred? Let it go. Number two, see light in this present darkness. See light in this present darkness. Out of years of oppression, hate, subjugation, I still believe that there is hope for you. The, 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 the prophet Isaiah said, arise and shine, for your light is come, and the, darkness, and, the, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, darkness, gross darkness, but the Lord will arise. In Songs of Solomon, chapter number 6 and verse number 10, I want them to put it there in the New Living Translation, the New Living Translation. He says, who is this? Arising like the dawn, as fair as the morn, moon, as bright as the sun, as majestic as an army with billowing bad banners. Listen, be a person who rises and people see you over the horizon and they wonder, who is this that is coming, rising like the dawn? Who is this who, has, as, who is fair like the moon? Who is bright as the sun, as majestic? Please walk with some majesty and know that there's hope. No matter how terrible and bad the terrain has been in America, wrong will never triumph forever. We are rising, we are rising big, and we are taking our place in this nation, e pluribus unum, out of many, one, and we bring our contribution. And finally, in the midst of everything, be the best version of yourself. Be the best version of yourself. You know, the last message I taught before I took my little break, after the pandemic, now what? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. After Black History Month, now what? Who would you be? Or you are going, after February, you are going to wait, then 2022 February, hey, Black History Month, 2023. No. Learn something. That's why I told these stories and I gave this example to unlock something on the inside of you that, listen, after the pandemic, after racism, after prejudice, after polarization of politics along racial and religious lines, who would I be? This is the time to determine to be something great. That I am going to be so good at what I do that nobody can afford to ignore me. Job 32 and, 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 and 8. Job 32 and 8. He said, there's a spirit in man and the breath of the almighty gives understanding. May God give you a problem-solving anointing where you can use it to your advantage that you are so good that people don't even see your color but they see the gift that you have. 
that it to be said true to what Dr. Martin Luther King said that you will not be judged by the color of your skin but by the content of your character. Let me go one step and say you will not be judged by the color of your skin but you will be judged by how good at problem solving you are. I've said it many times. Listen, not every African male is a thief. Not every African, African American woman is a prostitute. No, we are hardworking. We are powerful. Be the best entrepreneur you can ever be. If you're an attorney, be the best attorney. Argue your case with the Spirit of God upon your life. Go to those IT companies and let the Spirit of God come out and be a marketplace apostle where you're able to use your prophetic to solve technology problems. If you're in the hospital, a frontline worker, medical, there are so many of you here, doctors and nurses who are populated this church, plenty. Listen, take it out there and be the best. If you're a pastor, listen, stand in shoe leather, flat-footed, and preach the gospel with power and glory, regardless of whatever people see in you. Listen, you, can, you, cannot, you, can, you cannot stop people from being biased. But there's one thing you can do. You can stop yourself from getting under it. Joseph, out of prison and slavery, rose to become a prime minister. What is your, what is your problem? What is your point? Hear me. I want somebody to understand this. Don't let hatred put you down. It is time to rise. Wherever you are, bend down, bow down your heads and I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you right now. If you have suffered any form of prejudice or whatever, and out of that there's bitterness and hate in your heart, you want to talk to God to let it go. Release it. It's too, it's, it's, it's too expensive. Listen, you can afford to buy a new car every year. You can afford to change your wardrobe every month. But one thing you cannot afford is to harbor bitterness in your heart. It will kill the dream of God, the vitality of God. You cannot be angry with every. Not every white person is racist or prejudiced. You know, I have one here. Great brother, Pastor Ron. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Let it go. Let it go. And then you are going to pray that, Lord, empower me so much that I will become a viable addition to this nation. Let's do it. Go ahead. Don't stop. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm giving you a minute or two. Let's engage with him. Let's engage with him. Father, we thank you that out of this history we have learned about ourselves. We've been educated. Let us go out there and be better citizens to keep America one of the greatest ever in this world. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Now get ready. We're going to take our tithe and our offerings. The giving platforms are all there. Please do that. We have our cash up to those who are doing Zelle, to those who are doing um, PayPal, and text to give. It's all there. And of course, I know some of you also, listen, if you need an envelope, let the ush. I've told you, please, I'm begging you, let's make less contact as ever before. I was telling mommy just the other day that when I was coming out of Atlanta, between um, Atlanta and, and whatever, my passport was handled only twice. Check in, and then I think check in and uh, security before I entered the plane. But when I got to a particular nation that I'm going to leave lameness for security reasons, be, from the plane, before I got to my home, my passport had been handled over 12 times. Mommy said it, and I didn't believe it, over 12, in the time of pandemic. I didn't know whether to hold my passport back or not. So please, I'm begging you, all of you have cards. You go to Walmart, you go to every Costco, you go to everywhere. Let's give, but I know some of you want to feel the power. So you can give the cash. You can write the check. Let the ushers help you. You can go to the back or to the front, wherever the, the giving stations are, and let's do that. Let's give generously to the glory of God. So let Caleb and his people do it. And listen, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless. Bye-bye. Hey, listen, let me add this little announcement before um, Pastor Ben and Co. They run this. I told you before I, I, I left for my vacation that in the month of March, there's going to be a little change in our first service. I told you that first, I'm going to call it the leap service. The leap service. Listen, God, you've heard me, I want to say it again. God wants a spiritual church, but he also wants a smart church. Many of the things that have happened in our lives is not Satan. It's stupid. That slapped us. God doesn't expect you to cross the black river of death and come into salvation to be stupid. It doesn't glorify him. And many people tell, oh, the, the church has become motivation and blah, blah, the kingdom. The kingdom is made of wise people, made up of wise people. And I want to school you on life skills, on empowerment, on productivity. So that is what our first service is going to be, the format, the music, the teaching. I'm going to sit down like a professor. I may wear a professor's hat and teach you. It's called the LEAP service, L-E-A-P, the acronym. It's life. I'm going to teach you life skills. I'm going to teach you advancement. I'm going to teach you empowerment. I'm going to teach you productivity. It's going to be fast, furious, 
We are going to ask questions. Some days will be interactive, and it's going to be an amazing. That's the first Sunday of March. We are starting our lip service. God bless you. I love you, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.